This is the name of my talk, Dinosaurs of the West, with paleontologist-ish, Jean-Pierre Cavagelli, that's me, and you'll see my title down there. I have three jobs. Oh, and I, I did this talk originally for the Cary Memorial Library in Lexington, Mass., where I'm from, and I forgot to take that piece out of the uh, slide. But let's just move on. I am now, uh, hold on a second. Take this from the top. All right. Uh, I talk, I, so there are a few things I left in here with uh, my hometown, but I am a graduate of the University of Chicago from uh, 1983. And in 1982, I came out to the West and did a little internship at Wind Cave National Park. And that's where I caught fossil fever. I ended up getting a job for the summer in 1983 at the University of Wyoming. Uh, and that was collecting fossils from all over the state. I kind of fell in love with the state of Wyoming and with paleontology that summer. And then I went off to be a ski bum, basically. And then in 1990, I returned to Wyoming. I've been here 30-something years. And I say paleontologist-ish because I do not have a PhD at the end of my name. I'm just a Bachelor of Science from the University of Chicago. Uh, here we have a picture of the Tate, the insides of the Tate Museum where I work. Um, there's the museum itself. There's Casper. Um, just a little background. That's what the next few slides are going to be. There's, again, that picture repeated. Uh, what we do here is we offer dinosaur hunting field trips to the general public. And we do actually quite a bit of collecting of dinosaurs and other fossils. So here we are just generally doing field work in Wyoming. I get a few pictures of this. These are scenery shots, if nothing else, and collecting big fossils. And we also have a prep lab, which is basically where the fossils come to after we collect them and they get to uh, looking more like fossils than piles of rocks. This is one of my volunteers. She's working on a mosasaur specimen. Uh, We'll talk a little bit about mosasaurs a little bit in the future here. Um, the other thing I do is I'm the collections manager. I also, uh, the last slide I was supposed to tell you I take care of the prep lab, but that's mostly done work. The work is all done by volunteers. So here's a, an example of a specimen cataloged on our database. So those are my three jobs here at the Tate, excuse me, the Tate Museum. Uh, most of the real work is done by volunteers. So here we see a couple of our volunteers working on, on the right, an ichthyosaur specimen and another volunteer uh, taking pictures of fossils, which will end up in the database. Uh, other things we do is we identify stuff for people. Uh, we get a lot of dinosaur eggs come into our museum here, and mostly they're not dinosaur eggs. Matter of fact, I've only been here 17 years, and we haven't seen one yet. They're not very common, and they haven't been found in Wyoming yet. Uh, we also run a conference every every summer, first weekend in June. We get a, a dozen speakers from around the country to talk to us about various topics. Next summer, we're doing the Triassic, so this is a shameless plug. If anybody wants to drive out to Wyoming or actually participate online, uh, there will be a virtual conference, which we learned to do this year. Um, this is a TV show that George was talking about, and you'll notice this is June 21st, the first day of summer in Wyoming. Notice the outfits. It was a high, we had a high of 45 this day. So one of the things about working in Wyoming is that the weather cannot be trusted. George was asking me earlier what our field season is. And for trips where we have to organize well in advance, we do June, July, and August, and September. And this year, we're actually running late into September, and it's a little risky. We may get cold again. After that, or before that, it just may snow any day. So we have fairly limited, reliable field season. But then we also get beautiful days in November where we can go out with my volunteers on a more spontaneous note. Uh, this is, so these folks in the picture on the left are all our, basically our pay to dig folks who came out and that's my dog and my cat. So you gotta have them in your slideshow. And we also do fossil vacations through the Tate and otherwise. Uh, so again, the dinosaur digs down in the bottom there. And a few years ago, we did a history of paleontology trip, which is now 
forecast for 2023, the second version of it. Uh, so we do fossil preparation includes working on big bones, which is all I have pictures of here. And I also do fossil preparation in, in my basement lab, which is what you see in the bottom picture. The right picture is one of my volunteers working on a really big turtle. You see the skull is right above his, uh, his whisk broom there, his brush, the, he's brushing the shell. It's got a beautiful back foot. This specimen is now on display at the museum. And in the top left picture, we're working, I am working on a, a mammoth that we collected in 2008. And that's also featured in the museum. That was the one in the slide in the beginning. And I also do freelance fossil prep uh, of a, different kinds. This is the top one is a specimen I did in Fairbanks, Alaska for the University of Alaska. The bottom left is a turtle from that I did for the Denver Museum. And the bottom right hand is a sheen uh, shot through a microscope. So this is my specialty really, but I don't do much of it at work, but I supervise a bunch of folks. But enough about me, let's, uh, let's talk about dinosaurs. Everybody loves a good dinosaur. Dinosaurs were first discovered as it were in 1822 in England. Uh, in the next 20 years or so, a few interesting specimens were discovered, including a large jaw of a carnivorous dinosaur, all in England. The term dinosaur was invented in, 19, in 1842 by Richard Owens, a scientist in, in London. And basically it was a, a term used to describe large reptiles uh, only known from bones and teeth that lived in the past. And in 1853, there's a classic uh, early dinosaur um, meeting that happened in an iguanodon skeleton or a uh, life reconstruction in London again. It's a pretty classic picture there of a classic event. I'll talk more about the Crystal Palace right here. The Crystal Palace is in the suburbs of London and in the late 1850s, the part of the fun of that same dinner was that they put up a bunch of cement statues of large extinct animals that were known at that point. Uh, in the foreground, uh, you know, I don't even know what these things are without seeing them in person. But the one in the background is the iguanodon, which is now, which is shown in, in a four-footed position. It's now known to have been more two-legged, standing upright. But these things still are out there, and they were actually vandalized in 2020, which is really sad. I think there, there's some uh, crowdfunding going on to fix these things right now. But someone busted off some of the animals' noses. Bad. Um, moving on. Back to the 1850s on this side of the pond, uh, the Hayden expedition was exploring the West and in 1854, they found some really big bones in what was to become Montana. So that's the first dinosaurs found in the, the US. And in 1858 in Haddonfield, New Jersey, no one ever thinks of New Jersey as a dinosaur state, but the first complete dinosaur skeleton was found in a quarry and is still on display at the Philadelphia Academy of Natural Sciences. And then in 1860s, the Transcontinental Railway came. That opened up the American West and uh, opened up a whole new world. I think I have another, uh, yes, yeah, some of the other earlier dinosaur skeletons were found in the Belgium, in the bottom of a deep coal mine, a, uh, not an open pit, but a, a, what do you call it, underground mine. And they found, I think, 17 skeletons of the iguanodons. And they're also still on exhibit in Brussels. So yeah, back to the, the railroad opening up the United States to the West. Uh, in the 1870s, dinosaurs started getting found. As, as people settled here, at this point, Denver has become a, a small town kind of at the end of the rail. Uh, I don't even know if it's on the railroad line. So I'm making that up, but you know, it's pre-railroad in Denver. But uh, a school teacher out there found some bones outside of Denver and basically made them known to the scientists back east who had studied the iguanodon. And it actually became a site of the famous Cope and Marsh Wars, which I won't go into much. It's a, there's books and books, stories written about this. It's a, a whole topic for another hour of me chatting or somebody else chatting. Uh, little map ups there shows where these quarries are south of Denver. And at the same time, 
Dinosaurs are found in Como Bluff in Wyoming. So a little map shows you where that is, southern Wyoming, uh, in about 1870s, late 1870s. And the bones between these two sites are, are some of the more famous dinosaurs that we know that even uh, that every four-year-old knows before they start studying the exotic ones, things like Stegosaurus and Allosaurus and Brontosaurus. The list goes on, but some, definitely some of the more well-known dinosaurs. Um, this area is still productive today. We, the Tate Museum is digging on this site and we are finding more bones, more quarries to work on. Uh, so back in the 1870s, these two guys, Cope and Marsh, Cope on the, on the right, Marsh on the left from the Yale Museum, Yale Peabody Museum and, the, and uh, Philadelphia Academy of Sciences, again, had a uh, big battle. It all started because one of them put the skull of an animal on the wrong end. And you can ask how that could happen. Again, that would go in the Cope and Marsh talk, but it's, it's a really interesting history of paleontology part. Uh, in the early 20th century, I'm focusing a little bit on Wyoming here. A rancher reported uh, finding really big dinosaur bison horns. And one of Marsh's men came out to the town of Lusk in Eastern Wyoming and found something that looks like the picture up on top. Uh, in the next 20 or 30 years, uh, about 30 skulls were collected of Triceratops, which is the, the drawing on the bottom here. So these things are a very different age than the bones I just, uh, than the dinosaurs I mentioned in the earlier pictures. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, so question we're gonna ask, what is a dinosaur? The classic answer is a big extinct lizard. The real answer is no, no, and no. They're not necessarily big, they're not extinct, and they're not real lizards. Lizards is one class, one uh, subgroup of reptiles, as as is snakes, and lizards do not contain the group called dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are just another group of reptiles. Uh, birds like this Quetzal in the bottom right are actually still living dinosaurs, and this has become uh, known in the past 30 years or so. So birds all around us are actually dinosaurs. I've been a bird watcher all my life and I accept them as dinosaurs, but I still don't call them dinosaurs, not in, not in public, they're birds. Um, so a little bit about taxonomy. Taxonomy is how we organize animals. Linnaeus developed the original taxonomy, which some of you folks may be familiar with in which we uh, organize animals by Ever, ever smallening groups, if you will, so that we have here the taxonomy of the black bear, Ursus americanus, and you have them in uh, species, genus, and family in order, all becoming larger groups of animals. And uh, without getting too much detail, this is the classic way of organizing uh, animals. And here's an example of how, to, how a Tyrannosaurus rex, a dinosaur would be classified uh, and this, this won't be on the test, but a lot of this will be. And to find, to ask the question, what is a dinosaur? I like to start with what is a mammal? Uh, most folks know what a mammal is. You look outside and you can see one, your cat, your dog. But what's the definition of a mammal? The classic definition of mammals is that the females feed their young via mammary glands and they have hair, but there's a whole bunch of other characteristics some of which are only mammalian and some of which are typically mammalian. Warm-blooded, there's a few other animals out there, birds especially are warm-blooded. Sweat glands, mammals are the only things that have sweat glands, presence of a neocortex on the brain. Uh, Four-chambered heart, we give live birth, but wait, wait you say, what about things like the echidna, a mammal that get, lays, lays eggs? Okay, most mammals give live birth. Lungs are operated by a diaphragm. We're getting some pretty technical stuff here. Non-nucleated red blood cells and limbs under the body. And I've drawn this line here because it should be one thing up. All these characteristics I mentioned so far are all soft tissue characteristics. If all you have is bones like we have for dinosaurs, you don't see any of this stuff. All you get is these 
other characteristics. So in fossil mammals, we look for these characteristics here. We have three bones in the middle ear, the incus malleus and stapes. If you remember them, your biology class, you remember that these are very small bones and as fossils, they are rarely fossilized, but they er occur in, in uh, cahoots with this next characteristics of having a single lower jaw. And if you think of a snake, snakes characteristically are known for being able to swallow something bigger than their head. And one of the reasons they can do that is because their lower jaw is actually made up of six different bones on each side. So they can actually take their jaw bones apart and their skull bones, their skull is not fused. So mammals have a single lower jaw bone and we have double occipital condyles. Those are the joints at the back of the skull that connect to the first vertebrae, first vertebra. We have just uh, two of them. All the other animals have just one. Uh, we have no lumbar ribs. That means we have no ribs down in the lower back. We have a hard palate. This one's pretty interesting. The hard palate, if you stick your finger up there, there's bone up there. Most other animals do not have that. Uh, an exception is crocodiles. Uh, and the reason for that is because is actually connected to this very first one up on top. Uh, the hard palate is one of the things that develops pretty early in, in a, young mammals and it allows mammals to suck on, mom, on mom's breast. And this happens in things like marsupials where the marsupials are basically born as fetuses. One of the few things that they have that's well-developed is the hard palate and the tongue, allowing them to basically crawl up pathetically to mom's, uh, marsupial mammals don't have a breast per se, but they have a, they, they ooze milk out of their bellies. I know it sounds gross but these hard palate allows them to, to do that. Unfortunately, a lot of the older mammals, when you get down to old, old fossils, we don't have these things preserved. Uh, we have differentiated teeth. So we have incisors, we have molars and canines and premolars, and we have seven cervical vertebrae and no cervical ribs. Again, these are pretty technical and the leg joints fit nicely together in mammals. And I like to compare this with when you eat a chicken, I don't know how many vegetarians we have in here, but when you eat a chicken, all those chicken leg bones have really big gobs of cartilage at the end. Uh, if you go ahead and try to put, you take the cartilage off and you try to put them back together, they don't really fit nicely together because you're missing a quarter inch of cartilage. That happens too with dinosaurs. You're missing a lot of their joint because they were made of cartilage. In mammals and mammal fossils, even if you get, an, uh, the, the cartilage is only, oh, let's say a millimeter thick, if at all, and allows the bones to make nice joints where the bones themselves without the cartilage actually fit together. So the, uh, the interesting thing about this is that we have a lot of characteristics here. And as you go back in time in the fossil record, these things, especially the bony ones down the bottom of my list, they come and go and they disappear and dis and appear in different places. So paleontologists had to decide on one of these defines mammals and that's it there, the single lower jawbone. And one of the reasons they can do that is because this lower jaws are actually one of the more common fossils on fossil mammals. So let's take this whole uh, process to the dinosaur world. I'm not gonna give you all the characteristics of dinosaurs but paleontologists have done the same thing with dinosaurs. They've limited, limit, eliminated all the characteristics except one. And that characteristic is the hole in the acetabulum here. This is the pelvis. The hole where the femur fits for the ball and socket joint of the femur is a hole that you can see right through. In mammals, there's actually a, a really nice socket back in there that is made up of these three bones. But in dinosaurs, it's an actual hole. In birds, it's an actual hole. The only other animals that have that is pterodactyls. And I'll get to a little bit more of that. They are non, rep, uh, dinosaurs are non-flying, whereas rep, uh, pterodactyls fly. And then they walk with their legs straight beneath them. How do we know that if we've never seen them walking? Well, A, we have plenty of footprints and B, uh, the structure of the pelvis and the femur together they only fit together in one way such that the legs go straight down. All right. Now that we know what a dinosaur is, this will all be on the test, folks. Remember, uh, what about pterosaurs and pterodactyls? 
there's a pterosaur in the picture. These things are not a dinosaur because they fly. What about ichthyosaurs? These things, these, I'm gonna go through a bunch of extinct reptile groups that are often confused with dinosaurs. These are not a dinosaur. Their structure skeletally is completely different. You may not notice that until you study these things, but they are very different from the dinosaurs. What about plesiosaurs, such as the Loch Ness Monster? Again, these things skeletally very different. And that's, I mean, I, I'm not gonna give you details, but just know that they are not dinosaurs because their skeletons are very different. What about mosasaurs? These are not dinosaurs. These are actually much closer related to the modern uh, varanids, which include the, the Komodo dragon. So a family of lizards. These things are actually big extinct lizards, but they're not dinosaurs. And these things died out at the same time as the dinosaurs did. So mosasaurs do not exist anymore. They were a interesting group of marine lizards that got actually pretty big, up to 60 feet long. Um, another way to define dinosaurs, and I'm gonna do this one fairly quickly, is a, a system developed in the 1960s to classify insects called cladistics. And this is based on organizing animals based on shared derived characteristics. For a long time, it was fairly controversial because what does the scientist define as a derived characteristic? Uh, again, if you're taking a paleontology class at the University of Chicago, this topic will take you a whole week of, of three days a week class. And the definition of a dinosaur, there it is. I'm gonna let you read that. Oh, maybe I'll read it out loud because it's pretty confusing. Dinosauria is a group that contains the most recent common ancestor of birds and the non-avian dinosaur Triceratops, including all the descendants of that common ancestor. Which to me leaves me wondering, what? Anyway, cladistics works kind of like this. And um, the reason I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this really quickly. Most of these come from uh, Tom Holtz's website. He's a dinosaur paleontologist at the University of Maryland. You get all these crazy extinct creatures. Everything on this, this chart is extinct, except for the crocodile forms at the top left. Uh, and you see that with each, well, with some of the, the forks in the, in the taxonomy, he's got certain characteristics highlighted. We're gonna move up into the top right section here. Take a closer look at that. And I'm not gonna go through all the, the details Here's a cladistic view of the dinosaurs as a group. And you'll see again, he's got the taxonomy above the, uh, the way they're classified. And also in red, the characteristics. Notice it's fairly technical. And moving closer up to the top right into the sauropods and theropods. Actually, I'm doing only theropods here. Again, lots of different carnivorous dinosaurs here. And you notice the more you get up to the upper right hand side, they start looking like birds. And if so, the point of all this is that if you take all these creatures and compare them by shared derived characteristics, birds fall out right in the middle or on the end of the dinosaur stick. And this is why dinosaur, this is why birds are considered dinosaurs. So where does that leave me? I can't remember my next slide. Uh, so basically, the lesson here is that identifying fossils, either way you do it, is a matter of comparative anatomy. You take bones and you compare them to other creatures. Uh, enough of that. Let's go back to Wyoming. We're going to go look for some dinosaurs. So the second half of my talk here is a little bit about how to find dinosaurs in Wyoming, because this is what I'm familiar with. Again, there's this classic picture from the 1880s of Como Bluff which if you can see my arrow, Como Bluff is down in this area. This is a geology map of Wyoming. Uh, if you can't read it, don't worry about it. Uh, we're gonna go to this part of the state, Eastern Wyoming. The Lance and the Morrison formations are, are the two most dinosauriferous fossil formations in Wyoming. Formation is a name that geologists give to a rock pile. It doesn't mean the shape of like the old man of the mountains in New Hampshire or other classic uh, formations of rock. It's, on, it's formation in geological terms is on a much larger scale than that. Uh, so quick recap of those two. The Morrison Formation, which is what Como Bluff was, where that painting from 1880s was. 
is about 140 million years old. It's named after the town of Morrison, Colorado. It's found all over the Western US from New Mexico to central Montana. Uh, similar aged rocks with similar dinosaurs are found in Europe and Tanzania. And plants in it are primarily palms, cycads, horsetails, ferns, and evergreens. So there's no grasses, no flowering plants, and has been collected to, from 18, 1880s, I should say 1860s in there. And here's a list of some of the more well-known dinosaurs. Uh, let's go see what's next. Here's a visual of the black, the black specks on the map are outcrops of the Morris information and some famous quarry and site names. And you'll see the dotted lines are the states. So here's Wyoming right up here, Colorado down here, New Mexico, et cetera, et cetera. Table, the, the table here is the list of critters found. And you'll see that the, the dinosaurs are only most of the right-hand side. There's a pile of other creatures found in the Morse information. Most of these are found as side effects of looking for dinosaurs. And the last formation, which is latest Cretaceous, 70 to 65 million years ago, is named after the tiny town of Lance Creek. Actually, it's named after the creek. I'm correcting myself. Uh, it's only found in Wyoming, but there's very similar aged rocks in other Rocky Mountain states, including Montana, the Dakotas, Colorado, <coughs> excuse me, and, and also in Mongolia. The plants are primarily palms and sequoia and some flowering plants. So flowering plants have come to being at this point, but grasses, not yet and has been also collected since the eight, late 1800s and keeps going on today. And again, here's a list of the dinosaurs you may know or that your fourth grader may know from the Lance Formation. Uh, here's a more comprehensive list of the dinosaurs on the left, non-dinosaurs on the right. And, you know, I, uh, I enjoy studying and looking for and collecting and preparing dinosaurs, but these things on the right, the other things that lived with them, to me, that's the more interesting stuff. These things give you a good view of the whole ecosystem. Uh, when you look at some of these things, there are 25 species of turtles in the Lance Formation. So that means 25 species of turtles existed together. If you go to Florida, a place that's rich in turtles, I'd be, I don't know how many species live down there, but I bet it's less than 10. So there's something going on in the Lance Formation that makes this a very, a very rich ecosystem, based on turtles anyway. And there's also three species of crocodiles. Even the Everglades only has two. And I think there's very few, I don't think there's any place in the modern world that has more than two species of crocodiles living together. Uh, oh, T-Rex is in there too. That was for a previous talk. So why the American West? This is uh, this ans this slide answers the question in one fell swoop. So the things you have to have to find dinosaur bones are sedimentary rocks. They have to be the right age, and they have to have the fossils in them. So dinosaurs existed. If you look at the chart on the right during the Mesozoic, the green period here in the middle. When I say dinosaurs, I'm not including modern birds. I'm using the classic definition of dinosaurs. So dinosaurs existed during the green periods here, the Ju Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. So you have to have the right rocks of the right age that have bones in them. Then you have to have a mountain building event such as the Rocky Mountains that bring these old rocks to the surface and at the same time erode them. And the Western lack of vegetation, which you guys don't have that in Illinois, is, is a bonus. This picture down here is actually a road cut, so it's a man-made lack of vegetation. But you can see the, the the beds are very tilted. This is on the edge of uh, edge of the Rocky Mountains, which you see in the background. This is in the town of Morrison, Colorado, which is actually right behind this hill. And this is the Morrison Formation from here on down. Very colorful, which is typical of the Morrison, the Jurassic dinosaur beds of the Rocky Mountain West. Uh, let's see what the next slide tells us. So here's a, uh, a drawing by Marsh from the 1880s showing the beds being uplifted. And he's imagining the cross section because he didn't cut the earth in half. He just uh, put two and two together and was able to 
uh, imply what was hidden underground. So you have the dinosaur beds here coming out at Como Bluff where he's got his little star and then they dip down here. So this whole area here has been uplifted and as it gets uplifted, the top layers become weakened as they spread out and they get eroded away so that you have these exposures of the older rocks here. And you get another uplift right over here, 20 miles away, where there's another famous quarry, the Bone Cabin Quarry. And, and this here is bottom is a, uh, a, a cross section of the same, same schematic. So that gives you an idea of the rocks exposed at Como Bluff, a classic Wyoming Jurassic site. Uh, so knowing all this, let's go on a field trip. Let's go find some Cretaceous dinosaurs in Eastern Wyoming. Uh, so how do you go about dinosaur hunting? First, you look for clues in older publications. And this is where I like to include this because libraries are a great source. Um, stuff on dinosaurs has been published in mag newspapers, magazines, well, I should say scientific journals for 150 years now. And the interesting thing about dinosaur paleontology is that a lot of the stuff that was published 150 years ago is still valid. If you go into a lot of other sciences, let's say molecular biology, well, heck, that didn't even exist 150 years ago. But uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the other scientific fields, the, the more science gets done, the more older ideas get uh, obliterated. In paleontology, a lot of the old facts still exist because you're basing your science on things that are visible and handheld and they don't change unless, of course, the museums lose them. But that's a different story. So we go to the library, you find your geology map. There it is. There's the state of Wyoming. We're going to zoom in and we're going to focus on this little square I've got on the right hand side. Uh, if you're familiar with the geography of Wyoming, this up here is the Black Hills, which extend into South Dakota. The red are volcanic plugs. One of these is Devil's Tower, famous for for people my age, famous for the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Uh, but we're going to go south of that. One of the things you can see is that you have a constant pattern of from bluish, ignore the pink, from bluish in the middle of the Black Hills to greenish. This color here is not supposed to be bright yellow, but it is bright yellow. So blue to green to yellow to pinkish. We have that pattern repeating here, repeating there. We have the same pattern repeating here and there. Very similar things all over the state. And all these uplifts, same thing going on down at Como Bluff. Out here, it changes a little bit just because they changed the color of the same aged rocks to orange. But you get the same stuff going on here. These are the, basically the same effect that you saw in those 1880s drawings of uplifts. All right, let's zoom in on that blue square. Here's the geology map of that blue square. Now, what we're going to look for is the last formation, which in this thing is the light green that takes up the most of the middle of this. And you'll see this little finger of different colors. That's a small uplift happening over here. I think the next slide shows what we're going to do next. Back in 1983, you would study aerial photos at the University of Wyoming. Some of us did that. But in 2021, Google Maps is available, and it's an amazing tool. So here's Google Maps of the same area. And let's look at them side by side. There's a couple of really cool things you can see here. Again, we're looking for the Lance Formation in the light green. If you look at the, well, let's, let's look at some landmarks here. The roadway comes down to the right edge of the map here with this other road going into South Dakota. Whoops. And same thing on the right-hand side. On the bottom, all this white stuff is in pink on the geology map. And just above the pink, you have this light, green, which goes to the top of the map, kind of along the road, and then in the southeast corner of the map. That's this nondescript stuff here that it, it basically makes the same shapes. Uh, this little thumb, I call it, of uplift is this little area here where you have a variety of rocks. And then this mass of stuff that looks kind of almost all the same is our target. That's the Lance Formation in the middle of the map. At this scale, Excuse me, at this scale, you can't see very much, but let's zoom in a bit. Okay, we've zoomed in, and this is what the Lance Formation looks like on aerial photos. The
the red is grass, the green is all is uh, river bottoms or more grass, uh, cottonwood trees probably. Uh, the whitish gray, that's where your rocks are exposed. That's where you want to go look. This little white spot, white circle left of center on the map is where we collected our T-Rex back in uh, 2012. And we left a big, big scar on the, on the land. The rancher was okay with that. He figured it'll grow back in 10 years. And I'm okay with that too. So you study the uh, aerial photos, then you go find the topo maps. And let's go look at a topo map. These are published by the USGS all over the country. This is the map for the area we want to go to. We're going to zoom in a little bit. Uh, if I go back a few slides, look at the pattern on the roads here. Notice there's a fork down here, and then there's a fork over here. Let's go back and look at that topo map in close up. Okay, we didn't get to the second fork, but there's that first fork. There's the dirt road. All these gullies are the stuff that was showing up as lance formation outcrops. Our T-Rex hole was right about there, just underneath the 4149 windmill. 4149 is the elevation, by the way, above sea level. Uh, then you got to go find out who owns the land. I think uh, this slide is out of order. There. Uh, this is available in Wyoming, available online. That same area we were just looking at, this is the fork in the road. And we're looking at this area here. This is a slide, so I can't do this interactively, but it belongs to the Cross A Ranch. So what we do next is get permission. Uh, we got permission from these ranchers 15, 16 years ago. We've been collecting on their place for that long and they become good friends and good colleagues and partners with the museum now. Uh, then what you do is you walk around a lot. So you take your topo map and you find out, we actually draw on the maps where the boundaries of the ranch are. Uh, nowadays with uh, GPS units, you don't have to do that so much. You give people a GPS and uh, there's a program that tells you whose land you're on. It's pretty, sophist pretty sophisticated stuff. But, uh, and you take notes while you're out there. So this is us walking around looking for fossil sites in the Lance Formation. Uh, let's see what we find. Oh, look, there's a bone. And I will admit that when my volunteer, Steve, found this, I told him that that was not a bone, that it's just a simple rock. And Steve laughed at me and said, no, JP, this is a bone. And he, we eventually exposed it. It turned out to be a nice piece of a skull of an animal called the Pachycephalosaur. And this is Steve who found it in the green shirt, watching, uh, supervising me as I collect it. Uh, a little bit about field tools. So as a slight aside, keep this thing in mind. Field tools. So some of the main tools we use are oyster knives, which is the white handled tool next to that T-Rex tooth, and paint brushes and picks like that orange thing in the top left of the left photo. When we get down to a bone bed like this, a bone site, the bones tend to be very fragile and you can see cracks under the paintbrush on that uh, duckbill dinosaur vertebra. So we have to go very slowly and very gently. Uh, even though they're in rock and made of rock, they are quite delicate. The, uh, the specimen on the right is a T-Rex tooth. And you can see that there's kind of discoloration above and to the right of my uh, oyster knife there into the quarter and around the tooth. We usually pour a plastic preservative on the bones to keep them in one piece or to keep them from falling apart anyway. And that's what that discoloration is. Uh, as we get bigger, we uh, use plaster and burlap, which is what the fellows on the right are doing on some bigger bones. Um, the fellow on the right, there's a plaster jacket next to, uh, well, to his, our left of him, his right. But you can see a bunch of bones. This is a hadrosaur core. You can see some bones sticking out above that plaster jacket. And in front of this gentleman, uh, the tarp in the background is what we cover the quarry with when we leave for the evening. And then when we get to bigger stuff, we uh, hire some, some uh, higher, well, I shouldn't say hire, this guy with the caterpillar, he volunteered to drag this rock out of the field. This is on an oil well platform. And we found some uh, articulated fish in it, which was pretty cool, very uncommon. So we are happy to have collected this one. 
And if things get even bigger, we have a tripod and an engine hoist. And we invented a, a system of hauling things up the hill. The quarry, you can see on the right-hand picture, the quarry is down behind the, the fellow's butt and the brown shirt. The blue rock down there, that's the quarry. The bones here are in a plaster jacket that weighs about 700 pounds. And this is being pulled up by a truck on top of the hill. And we had to get all kinds of permits to do, to do this one. Uh, but the jacket, the jacket is the same one that's being hoisted by the uh, block and tackle on the right hand, a uh, left picture. And it took about an hour to get it up the hill. And when you collect a T-Rex that's 18 feet long, you end up getting even bigger tools. We had a lot of, uh, a lot of publicity on collecting a T-Rex, which was nice because it helped a lot of local companies donate their uh, equipment. Also take notes when you're out there. This is a quick shot of the field notebook showing where bones are and giving them numbers so that we know what they are when we get them back in the lab. Back to that skull that Steve found that we were expo exposing. Uh, we have plaster jacketed it now. And then we take it back to the lab and we eventually catalog it. So this uh, is the actual catalog record of it. It looks like that, we'll see more pictures. The picture on the left is not anybody working on that specimen, but it's just lab shot. But here's the specimen again, top left is the specimen as we found it. And the other pictures are three pictures, side view of the specimen as, as it exists after being cleaned up. The bottom picture is a picture of the animal. And you can see it's the top dome of this guy's head. And what makes it different from a rock? Well, that's a whole different topic. It has bone texture. That's this. That's the quick and simple answer. My guess is that when people found these things initially back in the early days of collecting, that they had no idea what they were unless they found the little spikes in the eye hole. But even complete skulls of these things are very uncommon. Uh, if you actually find something big, big this, this is where it takes, like this is our T-Rex dig. Uh, it takes a lot of planning, permission, uh, it takes a lot of people, logistics of all sorts, budgeting and fundraising. And then your more, most important question is what you're going to do with something really big. Uh, we ended up making a deal with the landowners and they were happy to have us find this and collect it and leave it in the museum here. And it actually took about five years to completely prepare, but that's it on the right hand side. It's a headless T-Rex specimen. And it is the seventh one found in Wyoming, and it's the only one staying in the state. All the others are somewhere else, including one at the University of Chicago, right down the street from you guys. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to talk a little bit about paleontology in general. Paleontology is more than just dinosaurs. And let's go to Illinois real quick on the right-hand side of my little slide here. Illinois has no dinosaurs, sorry to say. There's a little bit of Cretaceous rocks in the southern part of the state, and I know people have looked in there for dinosaurs, but they're, as far as I know, the rocks are marine in origin, so they were deposited at the bottom of the ocean. There's not much outcrop because it's, uh, it's too wooded. So you have to look in the streams, and if there's any quarries, but stream beds is where you'll go and look, and no dinosaurs have been found, and there's no Jurassic or Triassic as far as I know in Illinois, and the rest of the state is much older than dinosaurs. But you guys do have some of the best Carboniferous fossils in the world, which is uh, about the middle of the Paleozoic, so way before dinosaurs. And you guys have more trilobites than we have in Wyoming. But Wyoming has all kinds of other fossils besides dinosaurs, including stromatolites that you that if any of you saw the show with Emily Grassley, the stromatolites on Medicine Bow Peak were featured in that. The Devonian, there's some, I call them fish things. They're not fish. They're not amphibians. They're still swimming. They are trying to make their way onto land, but we have a deposit of those things. The other best deposits for that in the continent are in, uh, in Eastern Canada. We have a collection of Triassic reptiles not much, but it's growing. A young scientist who is originally from Casper and now at the University of Madison, University of Wisconsin in Madison, up the road from you guys, has been finding Triassic reptiles in Triassic burrows. 
And we have the best uh, records of late Cretaceous and early tertiary mammal fossils in the world. So we're talking about the KT extinction here, the, the uh, comet, asteroid, whatever you want to call it, that hit the planet at the end of the dinosaur period. That part is recorded here too. And so is the evolution of mammals after the dinosaurs went extinct. And we have some fish quarries in Western Wyoming that are collected for commercially. And if any of you guys ever make it out to Wyoming, those people out there will charge you money and let you dig fossil fishes to your heart's content. And the fact that they are digging lots of fish has created, basically they find the rare stuff by digging the common fishes. So we have a really good Eocene bird record record here in Wyoming. And we have the largest complete Columbian mammoth skeleton in the US, which is the one I showed in uh, my Tate Museum pictures. I think that's about what I have to say. And I'd like to thank you guys for listening and thank these other folks, including George, who invited me to do this. And look, George, here's my bird watching picture. All right. I think that's what I have to say. And I'm open for questions if I can figure out how to get out of here. Yeah, and if anyone has a question, uh, feel free to type it into the Q&A at the bottom of your screens. And uh, JP will answer your questions. I, uh, I got one question here from Joseph Kubal. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Have you heard anything about the four-legged whale skeleton recently found? I saw the headlines. They found some uh, a four-legged whale skeleton in Egypt. And I haven't had times to look at look at to even read the story behind the headlines, but uh, Egypt has been known for some pretty good fossil whales. Uh, the whole story of fossil whales is another great talk because 30 years ago when I started doing this, very little was known about fossil whales. But in the past 30 years or so, folks have been exploring and actually actively looking for them in marine deposits that are kind of near shore at about the right time of, of uh, geological, geological time. And they have found an incredible transition from basically land, land dwelling mammals to four legged whales, to two legged whales that have useless back legs, but functional front flippers like a seal. And then moving on to uh, whales that have no back leg and actually flippers instead of front legs and all the all the changes that have to go with uh, whale skulls. Whale skulls are really crazy things because they do things like, well, you have to breathe through your nose. So their nose hole is up on top. They are asymmetrical. So in this whole evolution of whales that has been uncovered, you see the skull becoming asymmetrical. And they do that because uh, they are, uh, they're, sent, they're basically using sonar to find things underwater. And so if your skull is, by building an asymmetrical skull, they're able to dis, uh, differentiate between stuff on the left-hand side and right-hand side. It's kind of like having, they can hear in stereo much better than we can even imagine. Owls do the same thing. Owls who are really dependent on hearing have very asymmetrical ear ears. Anyone else? Any other questions? Questions, questions? Let's see. Oh, there. I don't know if I had my video shut off the whole time, did I? Yes. Dang it. So we can, too. We can see you now. Uh-huh. And uh, I'm just checking here to see if we have any other uh, questions. Okay. One answered. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions? Certainly someone must have a question. If you guys don't have a question, I'm going to ask you guys questions and make it a very difficult test. I see Scott Galloway asked a question there. Buffaloes are common in North America less than 200 years ago, even in Illinois. Yep. One would think that for every mammoth found, 50 buffalo skeletons we found. That's a really good question. Uh, I'll tell you, our, our mammoth was found by a guy with a bulldozer. And when we started looking into mammoths, we found that there are 37 mammoth sites in Wyoming. And that includes, 
you know, an isolated femur leg bone found somewhere. Um, it also includes one site where Indians had butchered and organized their buffalo bones, which is uh, a classic archaeological site. But most mammoth sites in Wyoming are isolated bones. But buffaloes are indeed a lot more common. Uh, I've been here at the museum for 17 years now, and we've probably had 10 people come in and report buffalo, buffalo bones to us. And one of the problems with finding buffalo bones is that they are incredibly similar to modern cow bones. So uh, they're hard to tell apart unless you have the actual lower jaw or unless you're one of the two people in the state who can differentiate. And those guys are archeologists, I'm not one of them. Uh, so we, unfortunately we, we tend to uh, ignore, ignore is a strong word, but we tend to not be too concerned with bison skeletons. As for bisons in Illinois, I, I imagine they're out there too, probably weathering out of stream, stream banks as we speak. I know there's, uh, there's a couple of big, big rivers in eastern Iowa and, and in Nebraska and even the Arkansas and Kansas that people go looking for ice age bones such as bison. And you know, they float the uh, rivers and look on the sandbars and people find bison bones there all the time. So I imagine they're out there in Illinois too. The other thing we found in looking for mammoth information is that when you get into the next state over in Nebraska, heading one state east, almost every county in Nebraska has its own mammoth. They were incredibly more common in Nebraska. And I think that might be a, a factor of altitude. So as soon as you leave Wyoming, you, you lose quite a bit of altitude. And I think that's maybe why, but don't quote me on that. Of course, if this is being recorded and put on YouTube, I'll be quoted. All right. <laughs> That's my answer. <laughs> is that good, Scott? Any other questions? Scott, did I answer your question? Okay. If you, if you have any more. Yes. Oh, I got it there. Yes. Thank you. Okay, cool. So do you guys all understand now why birds are dinosaurs? Again, if I really wanted you to understand that, we would do that in a whole, a whole separate presentation. <laughs> but you can tell your friends that someone tried to explain it to you. <laughs> Yeah, we have a, a question here. Do you have any suggestions for books to read on the topic of fossil hunting and dinosaurs? Oh, uh, actually, fossil. let's start with fossil hunting. There's some, some pretty good historic books. Charles, a guy named Charles Sternberg. Let me type that answer in. Got this name. He wrote some, uh, oh, where did it go? Answer two, I see. There are books written about Charles Sternberg who was collecting fossils out here in the early 1900s. And I don't know, I think, I don't know the name of the book, but it, it's, uh, it's some great adventure, adventures in the uh, burgeoning American West. Uh, I almost read it in one night. Um, in terms of dinosaurs, uh, one of my favorite books that's easily accessible, and I'll type the answer in on this one. Uh, Who's in the Fossil Freeway by uh, Who's in the Fossil Freeway by Kirk Johnson and Ray Troll. So Ray Troll is the artist who did that, that uh, he did at least one of the drawings I use in my talk. Let's see if I can find it. Can you guys still see what I'm doing here? No, you can't. Uh, 
Yeah, we can see you. All right. I'm going to share my screen for a sec. Okay. Can you see this painting, this drawing? Uh, yeah, we can see the art by Ray Troll. Yeah. Ray Troll is the artist here, and he's a he's a paleo buff, paleo uh, fanatic, if you will. And Kirk Johnson is now the head of the Natural History Museum at the Smithsonian. But when he was in charge of the Denver Museum, him and Ray became good friends. And the book is basically the two of them driving around the American West uh, with Kirk as the teacher and Ray as the student. And it's really well done and nicely illustrated. And they've just come out with a second version, which uh, is about the Pacific Northwest, all the way from Alaska down to, I think, Mexico. So a little more than, let's call it the Pacific Coast. That one, I'm going to type in the answer. It's in the fossil coast line. There. Those two books are really good, uh, easily accessible. So, and, and Kirk is a great explainer and, and, and it makes the books very uh, non-technical yet understandable and educational. Great, thank you. I will make sure that uh, we get copies for the library collection too. Yeah, yeah, Esconi, uh, Joseph mentions Esconi, which is a, uh, that's what I call it out here. I never really knew what it meant. Uh, as a local fossil hunting club. Uh, Scott also asks, have any of the spiral tooth shark fossils been found in Wyoming? My answer is, I'm not gonna type it. Uh, I don't think so, but they should be here. They've been found just next door in Idaho uh, in, in deposits that also exist in Wyoming. But I think the difference is that they mine the stuff. They mine the, I think it's a phosphate deposit in Idaho. And I don't think they mine the stuff as much in Wyoming, but I would love to someday go and look. Yeah. So they should be here, but we haven't found them yet. Illinois has some pretty cool relatives of that thing, a, a shark called Edestus, which is found in the, the coal bed area southeast of Chicago. It's not quite spiral tooth, but it is a it is often found as a long 12 inch long uh, jawbone with seven or eight teeth that just get smaller as you go. There, uh, putting myself back on. Anything else? You know, I am curious about one thing. Uh, occasionally I hear about um, these beds of uh, fossils, uh, you know, different animals that are found together all in the mm -hmm. same place out there. Is that something you've encountered? Um, absolutely, yeah. Uh, I showed you that one picture of the T-Rex tooth uh -huh. that, had, that was explaining the tools we use. That is one from one of our bone bed sites. And bone beds are basically, imagine, uh, the Lance Formation would have been deposited in great big rivers coming off the burgeoning mountains, the Rocky Mountains. I like to compare it to uh, Bangladesh. And I don't know, I, I remember some serious floods happening in Bangladesh back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the beds in the Lance Formation are similar, where you get not only a flood deposit or a river deposit, but you get all these critters washed in. And on, a, on sandbars, the bones will just pile up randomly. So the bone beds that we, oper that we work on are oftentimes what we call multi-specific. So many, many different kinds of animals. So that T-Rex tooth we found was just an isolated T-Rex tooth. And all the other bones we found in that bone bed are isolated bones of other creatures. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, and, and I showed you that list of things found in the Lance Formation, which is probably you know, 20, 20 something species of, uh, of, of dinosaurs and then another long list of non-dinosaurs. And we tend to find parts and pieces of all those things, except okay. the pterosaurs. We have, we've collected 
for the museum, we've collected uh, probably thousands of bones from one from two bone beds like that. We have one pterodactyl bone, one pterosaur bone. Interesting. So those things are very delicate, and they were probably not common, and then they tend to fall apart pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, multi-species bone beds are pretty common in the Lance Formation. Uh, the Morrison, less so, but they exist there too. 